all week. <laughs> this is their turn. We still got a few stragglers coming. <laughs> and make room because you got to do the motions. Make some room. Make sure you can move your arms.
like a bird in the big blue sky Not a cloud or a care for a million miles I won't worry, worry about a thing God loves me and he loved me first He rescued me when I was in a lurch And I won't worry, worry about a thing I'm going to give a couple minutes so the kids can go find their parents. Go find the parents. And then we're going to watch a slideshow of your beautiful faces. Yay! Yes.
so that was our slideshow of the VBS. And you got to see different age groups, different things that they did. Um, the day always started off with the big kids coming in here. Chris, where's Chris? Chris led them in funny things, learned about their Bible verse, the Bible buddy, all that. Then they went off to their stations where they got to learn the Bible story with Miss Glenna. They incorporated science with the Bible lesson with Miss Leanne. And then they had games and snacks with Karen and Sierra. Don't see it. There she is. Um, and Barb and Jacob and Camden were there to help. So then our preschoolers, though, our preschoolers were led by Sam Utter right there. She, I am so thankful for her, guys. <laughs> she led her team. She gathered her team. She found her own team workers, which consisted of Crystal and where's Paul? Paul always sits over there. There you are. Paula taught the kids the Bible lesson every night. I don't know if you saw the pictures, but she got the kids to sit still. With the work, the helpers helped, but they sat still. My boys remember what they, what she taught them. You did so well, Paula. Thank you. And then our workers, Annabelle, Kayla, Vanessa, Morgan, and Sammy. You guys are all here. Thank you, guys. You made the preschool possible. Did you see their smiley faces? And now they know that Jesus loves them, that he'll rescue them. So then... Our big kids, Glenna, she was my right-hand woman, <laughs> not man. She, she told me her goal for VBS was to make sure I wasn't stressed. <laughs> she did wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> but she also had her own portion where she taught the kids the Bible. It was called Bible Discovery. And they got to act out the lessons. And it's amazing how the kids just pick up on it. You interact with them, you show love, and you show them God's word, and they just absorb it. <laughs> and then Leanne. Oh, my word, Leanne. We had, so, actually, I want to start off with, I've, I've been praying since August for workers. Last August, after VBS, I started praying. <laughs> and I was like, God, we need, we had, we've always had good workers, but it's always hard to get people. So I prayed that God would work in people's hearts, people's schedules, since August. And guess what? God intervened with, like, the Army schedule, doctor schedules, personal schedules, for Leanne to get here, even more. <laughs> but she's a science teacher, so she got to teach the kids, well, with energy, friction, and how that relates to God's, our Bible point. I wish she could talk, but... She may have an asthma attack. <laughs> so we are so thankful for her to come. And then we had Sierra. Thank you. You led the kids win games, which the games were a little complicated. But we made, you made up your own games, and it worked. And she had Camden and Jacob to help her. And the snacks. We made up our own snacks this year, too, Karen, didn't we? And Barb. <laughs> Thank you, guys. And then our crew leaders. So Caitlin, Co, Sherry and Megan who aren't here, and Jen and CJ, Trevor, thank you. I made a little video with your faces on it so everyone can see you. And I just want you to know, oh, is it up there? Was it going this whole time? Oh, I could have talked about each person. Oh, and Chris, yes, that, I talked about you. So I had written out a speech. It was like 30 minutes. And I touched base on each person because I knew what you had to go through to say yes to VBS. And I'm so, hey, Jared. And you said, thank you for saying yes to the media and the music. <laughs> um, on CJ the Pirate. Where? I'll lose people in here. Um, so thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you. Testing. Hi, Sam, stay on up here. Hi. So, 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 everybody, first of all, the kids did great this week, so it was very appreciated. So give your kids a hand clap. 
Secondly, she will downplay it, but this was my first time playing a major role in VBS. Normally, I'm just one of the helpers. So I got to see, starting a few months ago, how much work Sam put into this. So, yes, hand clap, please, because she... Again, she will try to downplay it like it was no big deal, but when she started thinking about this back in August, that is insane to put 10 months of thought into this, but she will do it. It is so nice to have somebody that has a passion for the kids as much as she does. So, as a small token of our appreciation, we just made her a little thing that Sierra is bringing up. So, it is our way and the kids' way of saying thank you for all the work. She did all the decorating. She was here for hours every day. Glenna helped, but she came up with all this stuff. So, we made that for her. Oh, yeah, everybody's in there. So again, yes, big hand clap. Thank you so much. Isn't it great when we can see the kids be ministered to like this? And you know what makes that possible? Is everyone out here makes that possible. I'm so thankful for your willingness to give to the Lord and to help out. Uh, we took a uh, second mile offering to help with VBS. And it's through that, those funds that we're able to, to fund uh, this particular event. We have another opportunity for you. If, you'll, if you haven't already filled out your second mile envelope, they're in the pew there in front of you. And we've already started this a couple of months back where we took a second mile offering to help send all of our, I'm going to call them young adults, <laughs> to youth camp. And we're going to, this week's second mile offering will go to help fund uh, sending our, our kids to youth camp uh, I grew up in that system. I met my wife in that system. Uh, youth camp is a tremendous thing. I started going when I was eight years old. Couldn't believe the cost. It was so incredibly expensive to go. It was $35. <laughs> it's a little more than $35, and that was 150 years ago. Moses actually taught us uh, that, at the camp that year. But it's a tremendous is a tremendous uh, opportunity for our youth. You make friendships that will last forever. I still have a friend that I got in trouble with that very first youth camp. We still, we still talk, we still carry on with each other at Facebook. The state won't let us get together anymore because we cause too much trouble, but anyway, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful event for them. So if, if you have one or two or three or $500 you wanna help to send kids to youth camp, please put it in the second mile offering envelope. We will be gathering those up. For the past couple of weeks, the Lord has been dealing with me on his blessings. Uh, and it's just, I've just been, I'm, I mean, I'm overjoyed. My, my soul was bubbling with happiness for what the Lord has been showing to me each week. It started out with, with him showing me my family and how much they love me and, and his blessings on them and, and how they, they grow and they mature. And he, he, show, he showed me, that even at work, how he blesses me, that because of, of my faithfulness to him, it's passed on, the blessings pass on for me to the people on my team, and they're successful. This week, the Lord's been dealing with me with, on, on, uh, uh, I might have done this, <laughs> passed my mind, it has, uh, he's been dealing with me on being faithful and obedient, that's the word I was looking for, being obedient and his blessing and how they interact with each other. And uh, he took me to the book of uh, 1 Kings chapter 17, and I was reading the story about Elijah and how the Lord told him to say that there would be a, a, a drought in the land and that there, it wouldn't rain, and even though it was putting his life in danger with the king. But he did so, and then the Lord took him out, 
and prospered him and fed him by the ravens, by the brook. And, I, I, and in my mind, I didn't say this physically, but in my mind I thought, well, that's the man of God. That's his calling. That's what he was supposed to do. He was just doing what he was supposed to do. The Lord said, yeah, but keep reading. So I kept reading. And when the brook dried up, the Lord told him to go to see the widow. And he said, do you have, can you get me a drink of water? And she said, sure. And as she started to walk away, the prophet said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. And bring me some bread back when you come. And she said, I've just got a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil. And actually, I was just getting ready to gather some sticks to make a fire so I could make the last of the bread. And then me and my son would die. And the Lord said, and the prophet said to the lady, she said, go ahead, do as you were going to do, gather your sticks, make your fire, but first bring me a piece of bread and then go back and make your own. And she was obedient and she went and she gathered her their sticks and she made her fire and she made her little bread and she brought it to the, to the prophet and I know as she gave that to him, she thought, I have nothing left. I used everything I had. But when she went back, the Lord provided. And the scripture said that the Lord provided for many days. So there's something about faithfulness and obedience to God in giving. A couple of weeks, or I guess it was a month ago now or so, when I was standing up here, I told you I was playing Mr. McGregor to a rabbit. Well, about two weeks ago, I was going out and I was inspecting the garden and, and I noticed a couple of the things that the rabbit had been eating on was, was rebounding and was looking pretty good. And I walked around the garden as I was coming back on one side, I looked down, there was something red in the grass. I thought, what is that? And I looked down, and there was two little tiny red strawberries growing. I have never planted strawberries. I don't know the first thing about planting strawberries. And I thought, where in the world did those come from? And I heard the Lord tell me, he said, you fed the rabbits with your vegetables. He said, and I've provided you strawberries. And I thought, that's just, that's just God showing off. That's just God's blessings. So don't ever think just because times are tough or money's short or, or whatever the excuse is in your mind that you can't give because when you give, God provides. So I encourage you to be obedient, to be faithful to God, and let God show off for you. If the ushers will come forwards, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I'm so grateful and so thankful for your blessings on our lives. God, your, your goodness just overflows. I, if, if I started today, Lord, and I thank you to the day that you returned or the day that you took my life, Father, I could never even begin to scratch the surface of your blessings, and I'm so thankful for that. And now, God, I ask that as we gather this offering unto you, Lord, that you bless it, that you multiply it, God, that you show off just a little bit and help us be able to minister and, and do the work that you've called us to do, Lord. God, I love you, and I never want to forget to thank and praise you for all that you've done. We pray in the name of your son, and the church says, amen. Praise God in this house. Hallelujah. I'm thankful for the VBS crew. I'm thankful for the kids. I'm thankful for those that, uh, that worked in VBS. And how about one more great hand clap of, of appreciation for them. Amen.
Amen. The ushers are finishing, and would you begin standing all across this building? I've been like a racehorse at a gate trying to get out for uh, several hours now. Just a word on my heart. Um, I want to begin reading, if I can, from Matthew chapter 2. Excuse me, Matthew chapter 25. And it reads like this in verse 35 and verse 40. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. I want to tackle something this morning that I know might be met with some opposition. Some people will tune me out immediately. Some people will hear the first point and tune me in. And then second point, they'll tune me out. I'm asking you to tune me in till I'm finished and then send me an email if you don't like it. But I want to talk to you about on the subject, what does the Bible say about immigration? What does the Bible say? Not what, not, what, not what the Democrats or the Republicans say. Not what I say. What does the Bible say about immigration? And how many of you will pray for your pastor today? That's three of you that will pray for me, and I appreciate those prayers. I told Glenn, I said, I'm a little nervous. Because it, it's a hot topic, especially in light of the, the news this week and the media this week and Facebook posts this week. Uh, people posting all over Facebook that I thought were Christians. And so... Uh, it's with a heavy heart and yet with great anticipation at what the Lord wants to do in us that I come to you today. Would you pray for me as I pray for you? Father, in Jesus' name, give an anointing that makes preaching easy and effective. Open our hearts, God. Open our understanding today to what your spirit is trying to say to us today about this real sensitive subject. And... Uh, Father, what, what the end result will be today, I pray, will bring you glory and honor because it is in the name of Jesus. It's on everybody's radar, especially in this political climate. Besides the text that we read, which we'll address a little more later, scripture, uh, other scripture references we'll reference today. Uh, one in particular that I find in Matthew chapter 2 is the story of Jesus, how he was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. Wise men came from the east to Jerusalem. Uh, Herod's heart was real troubled because he was supposed to be the king. There's a little bit of a jealous bone going on there. And Herod gathered all the chief priests and the scribes together and inquired of them uh, where Jesus was to be born, where the Christ was to be born. And they told him Bethlehem of Judea because that's what had been written by the prophets. So Herod had this secret meeting between himself and the wise men, and uh, he wanted them to tell him uh, to determine where the star appeared and what time the star appeared. And Herod sent them to Bethlehem, sent the wise men on to Bethlehem, and he said, go and search for the young child carefully, and when you found him, send word back to me. Come back and talk to me that uh, I may go and worship him too. That's Herod the king. And so they got to the house. They saw a young Jesus there with Mary, his mother. They fell down and worshiped him. Uh, they opened their treasures to him. You know, they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Wise men were divinely then warned in a dream not to go back to Herod. And so they just went ahead and went to the house instead of going back to Herod. Now, the, the Bible says that uh, when the wise men departed, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and he said, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will, uh, will seek the child to kill him, to destroy him. And so he arose, he took Jesus, he took Mary by night, departed for Egypt, and was there until the death of 
Herod. And that all happened so the scripture and the prophecy would be fulfilled that out of Egypt I called my son. So immediately we see here in the gospel according to Matthew, uh, we see something going on. A family is forced to flee their homeland for fear of persecution. And this uh, is a modern day definition of a refugee or an immigrant. So uh, did Joseph and Mary apply for official refugee status? I Probably not. They didn't do things then like we do now. Those kind of regulations probably didn't exist. But we do see a family fleeing a foreign land, going somewhere else in order to find safety. And, but even if Mary and Joseph do not fit the contemporary definition of refugees, which I believe that they do, we should still have compassion and be ready to care for modern-day immigrants. Why? Because Jesus asks us to. Matthew's gospel, Jesus reminds us that anytime we welcome the stranger, we welcome Jesus himself. When you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. And immigrants are, uh, uh, they're, they're in need of help. And so Jesus commands uh, to care for the stranger also. For the, for the Christian, uh, a law and any laws that would hinder or prevent uh, or outlaw such care uh, and compassion, I really don't think is scriptural. Uh, someone said, well, we've got to obey the laws of the land. And I, I understand that. I know what the scripture says. I also know that sometimes things are taken out of context. You even see the apostle Peter in the New Testament saying, we had rather obey God than to obey man. Amen. So there is a higher power and a higher law that we as part of the kingdom of God and the body of Christ that we are subject to. I, I'm always amazed at some Christians who, who uh, will talk about higher laws and, and appeal to higher laws with life issues, but when it comes to talking about this sensitive subject of refugees and immigrants, they remain just uh, very silent on, on uh, the subject. So let's make a jump to people coming to America. In fact, let me just preface this by saying that all of the stats and everything that you hear are prior to 2018, prior to 2016. So I don't want you to think that I'm trying to slant this one way or the other. But let's make the, 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 the jump. And let's talk about something that some pastors are afraid to talk about. Others maybe are not. Uh, but I know some guys won't touch this with a 10-foot pole. But we, whether we are for immigration or against immigration... The, the problem is, or the thing is, is I think we could all agree that we have a big problem with immigration in this country. Uh, the news media is reporting it. Everybody's reporting it. It's on every blog. It's Facebook. Everywhere you look, the perceptions around it, what to do about it. Everybody's got a different opinion on what should be done about immigration that is happening. Immigration is a problem. Most people, I, I believe, that are coming to America uh, primarily are not coming here to try to do any damage for the most part, by and in large. They're not coming to do any damage. They just want a better life for themselves and their family. And uh, I can't fix the immigration problem. You can't fix it. I can't fix it. That's not my job. My job is not to stand up here and tell you I can fix immigration. My job is to see the world around me and your job is to see the world around you and try to do something to make your world better. And so the church needs to uh, set out to minister to immigrants. And I, I believe that when the church begins to do this intentionally, it will revolutionize the church, not just here in Bourbon A, but it will revolutionize the church around the globe. The gospel of Jesus Christ, let me just say this, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the same everywhere and it works for everyone. If you have to change it, it's not the gospel. We may have to learn how to do it through an interpreter, but we must remember that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And it's the same gospel regardless of the color of your skin. It's the same gospel whether you're Hispanic or Asian or Arabic or Indian or Korean. And if the Lord allows, we may have to do it in different ways, but rest assured that the gospel, no matter what language you speak or what color your skin is, is the same 
yesterday and today and forever and it is the power of God unto salvation and I believe that when people hear the gospel regardless of their tongue people will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ if you believe in the power of the gospel would you just give the Lord a praise offering in here today immigration it's one of the most important and yet one of the most difficult topics of our time and uh, I'm not naive enough to think that I have the answers and that I can solve it in this short message today. My goal, though, is to try to bring some biblical clarity to us as followers of Christ to know what to do. Our nation's sentiment toward immigrants is engraved at the base of the Statue of Liberty. It says, give me your poor, your tired, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. America has historically been welcoming, and there's always been an openness toward outsiders. But today, many factors have, have triggered a, a changing in the thinking of people with, with growing concern. So, before we consider the problems that we face because of immigration, I want to give you the other side of the story. Let, let me tell you some of the great things that happen because we're a nation that welcomes immigrants. Can I tell you some of the good things that happen? Number one, here's the potential of immigration. Immigrants enhance American culture by bringing new perspectives and experiences to it. It brings multiculturalism to our country. It increases our tolerances for our indifferences, and, and it adds variety to our cultural experience. You think so? Absolutely. We love our choices of Mexican food, yes. Italian food, German food, Chinese food. Yeah, what is this? Every time I say your favorite, you clap. <laughs> Indian cuisine. Anybody here ever eat any Indian cuisine? Buddy, I tell you, that's the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> Thai food. It brings uh, cultural diversity. We, we, we love what... Folks from other countries are brought to our country. We celebrate many holidays that reflect their cultures. Anybody here wear green on St. Patrick's Day? Anybody ever been pinched for not wearing green on St. Patrick's Day? We love Cinco de Mayo. Yom Kippur, Ramadan, Chinese New Year. We celebrate it all. And here's the thing. Christians remain by, the, by far the largest religious group among legal, everybody say legal, U.S. immigrants. Uh, it's the largest group of US, uh, legal U.S. immigrants. 61% of legal immigrants uh, in 2012 were Christians. Over the past two decades, the United States has admitted an estimated total of 12.7 million Christian immigrants. I think that deserves a great big God bless you. That's actually a higher percentage than residents who live here. Of the approximately 11.1 million unauthorized immigrants living in the United States in 2011, an estimated 9.2 million, or 83% of them, are Christians. So there's a lot of positives and a lot of possibilities with the people who come to America. The potential that exists with immigration is just incredible. But as we know, not everything about immigration is easy, and we're seeing that and we're hearing that. If you're still tracking with pastors, say amen. amen. There are several problems with immigration, and nobody really seems to know what to do about it. So let, let's look at it. Point number two, the problems with immigration. Now, I'm going to be very, very candid. Uh, I may say, say some things that hurt your feelings. That's not my intention. I'm just laying it out there where it is, okay? Here's some problems with immigration. Problems, uh, there, there's problems not only with illegal immigration, but did you know that there's problems with legal immigration as well? Uh, the flood of immigration in the last two decades is a major contributor to unemployment in the United States. Now, according to the Department of Labor Statistics prior to 2016, the real unemployment rate, which includes discouraged workers no, no longer looking for jobs, is, was about 9.7%. Another issue is the failure of some uh, ethnic groups who come into our country and uh, they, they don't want to integrate into American life. 
Throughout our history, though, most immigrants adopted the language, adopted the laws, adopted the common customs of the host nation. Uh, so one of the other problems with legal immigration is not all, but some defy cultural assimilation. There are clusters throughout our country uh, uh, of legal immigrants who, who demand special concessions for their ethnic customs, their beliefs, their languages, and in some cases, even their laws. Ever, anybody here ever heard of Sharia? And, and so these are some of the problems with legal immigration. And if there are problems with legal immigration, think of the problems that exist with illegal immigration as well. According to combined studies of three uh, government departments in 2016, it shows, uh, the study shows that individuals who have entered illegally are responsible for a high number of crimes. Uh, it has a tremendous negative effect on social and government uh, services uh, that are provided to all Americans. Let me give you an example. How many of you, when I speak of Parkland Hospital, know the hospital that I'm speaking of? Anybody recognize the name Parkland Hospital? Okay, one or two in here. It's infamy is that that is the hospital where President John F. Kennedy died in Dallas, Texas. It's where Lee Harvey Oswald died after being shot by Jack Ruby, and consequently, it's the place where Jack Ruby died about four years later, totally by coincidence, uh, after he shot Lee Harvey Oswald four years later. So on the flip side of that, Parkland is also home to the second busiest maternity wards in the country, with almost 16,000 new babies arriving every year. That's like 44 deliveries a day, every day, for a year. That's a busy maternity ward. Somebody ought to say amen. They've been busy down in Texas. So here's what's mind-blowing whenever you do the research on it. In the first three months of the year 2006, we're not that far removed from it, 70% of the women who gave birth at Parkland were illegal immigrants. And the cost for delivering 16,000 babies, Parkland spent $70.7 million. Medicaid kicked in $35.5 million. Dallas County taxpayers kicked in $31.3 million. Federal government tossed in another $9.5 million. And so immediately people's minds are going to, well, babies can't help it. I know that. And that's not the point here. The point that I'm trying to make is this, is that the cost of having babies, whether they're legal, illegal, American, coming from south of the border, whatever, the point is immigration uh, and, and just caring for people in general takes a lot of resources. And that's all that I'm saying. And those are some of the facts that we are facing, some of the issues that we face. Now, if you leave here today and you say, Pastor Rick is against immigrants, Pastor Rick is against ba ba babies coming into the country, he's in support of family separation at our borders, then you don't know me very well and you've missed the entire intent of this message. There's great possibilities when it comes to entering our country. It's great for the immigrant. It's great for us. We learn from each other. But as proven again this week, we have some great challenges as well. Now, I, I'm not a political person. I, I don't want to get political here today, but friends, we all need to realize, and maybe we, at least we can agree on this, that, that our immigration system in the United States of America is busted. It's broken. And I can't do anything about it. I can't do anything about the immigration problem. I'm powerless. You you can't do anything about it. You're powerless. So let's, can we just get real this morning? The only power, and I'm going to say this is the only political thing I'll say all day, but let's get real. The only power you and I have is at the voting polls. Amen. And this is my opinion. I own it. And it's my opinion only. But if they don't fix this mess, I think we ought to vote all them jokers out of office. Yeah. Is that all right for me to say that? It's a mess. It's a problem. They need to fix it. But I want to take you on a journey in the past and into the present, and hopefully it'll give us some powerful ideas in the midst of the challenges. Immigration passed. God's original plan, all of us were to be as one family, one common language throughout the entire earth. We see that in Genesis. And then we see Nimrod and the Tower of Babel. Nimrod was the ruler of the Mesopotamian city of Babel. That's modern-day Iraq and Kuwait and Saudi Arabia. And he moved to gain power over all the people of the earth. 
by building this massive tower. Genesis chapter 11, you'll find that story, verses 1 through 9. He said, I will build this tower. It'll draw all people into a central location under my control. And this was man's first attempt at one world government. And without God, it would have been, uh, it would have been just total tyranny, unlimited tyranny. God put a stop to it. He divided the world's single language into many. Workers could no longer communicate with each other and the foreman. When you can't communicate with the foreman, guess what? Construction's over. The tower construction ended abruptly. People scattered throughout the earth, grouping uh, according to their new languages. And so while worldwide unity was God's original intent, The separating of the people in this situation was God's idea. Why was that? Because separating the people at this time and confusing the language was God's ordained protection against man's craving for power. Acts chapter uh, chapter 17, verses 26 and 27 from the New King James Version, the Apostle Paul says this, And as he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times, and their boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each of us. So as Paul explained, God scattered men and set the boundaries of their dwelling so that we would seek after God. This tells me one thing. This tells me that God loves everybody. God loves all nations. God loves all people equally. Just because we live in the United States of America, which I still think is a pretty good country in spite of all of our faults, we still don't have favored status with God just because we're American citizens. God loves everybody. God loves every nation. Can you say amen to that? God loves everybody. So here's the reason, initial reason for these boundaries. If God let one person, in this biblical example, it would be Nimrod. If God let one person be in charge of the world, there would have been tyranny like no one would have ever known. They would have had then what will happen when the Antichrist comes in the future and it would have been over, it would have been finished. And so that was God's purpose For everybody to live together, but because of the sin of man, his plan got derailed. And so here's the question you've got to ask. Well, then, Pastor, what do we do with the the situation that has been dwelt to us, has been dealt to us, the situation that we're living in? Does the Bible even really speak about immigration? Well, I believe that it does. In the Old Testament, you see it everywhere. In fact, there's nearly 200 references to immigration in the Bible. Did you know that? Now, we call them immigrants. God calls them strangers and sojourners. So here's the thing that God taught his people. The first thing that God taught his people was this. God's people are to assist the stranger. That should be the attitude of every Christian who knows Jesus Christ. That was the attitude of the Old Testament. Listen to the words. Exodus chapter 23, verse 9. Also, you should not oppress a stranger or immigrant. They're interchangeable. For you know the heart of a stranger because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. God said, don't treat strangers badly. Remember what it was like for you when you were a stranger in Egypt. That's what God tells them. So the first principle that we see is God's people are to assist the stranger. Make sure that you accept the strangers that are among you. After that, after that, you are to assist. uh, After you assist the stranger, point number two here is God's people are to accept. Everybody say accept the stranger. Now don't get lost here. God commanded the acceptance of strangers, foreigners who were willing to adopt his laws. Leviticus chapter 18, verse 26, you shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments and shall not commit any of these abominations, either any of your own nation or any stranger who dwells among you. So the Old Testament gives us many examples of foreign-born men, foreign-born women who were accepted as citizens of Israel. In the New Testament, it does not address immigration directly, but, but we, we watch what's going on and, and we see Jesus demonstrating attitudes of love and acceptance toward non-Israelites. Jesus, he met a Samaritan woman. 
unheard of in his day. Not just the fact that she, she was a woman, but the fact that she was a Samaritan woman. I mean, they were considered the lowest of the lows. And he engaged her in earnest conversation and then led many of her friends to the faith. How about the famous parable of the good Samaritan? You know, you got the priest, you got the Levite, you got the Samaritan that comes by. This guy beating up on the side of the road and, and, uh, and the, the fellow wanted to know to Jesus, he said, who? Who is my neighbor? And Jesus said, well, you got the priest, you got the Levite. That, recommend, that, that actually symbolizes the, uh, the priest and the preacher and then the, the good Samaritan. And, and what Jesus did in here was unthinkable what he did. He didn't make the priest or the Levite the hero. He made the Samaritan the hero of the story. It blew, blew everybody's mind back in that day. What's he doing making a Samaritan the hero? Jesus, you see, made no distinction among the races. Let me just tell you this. We were all created in God's image. And God demonstrated that we are to love all persons equally regardless of their ethnicity. Can somebody say amen to that here today? When you're sharing Jesus Christ with people, with your friend, with whoever, should the first thing you say is, now before we talk about Jesus and eternal life, now are you here legally or illegally? Could, could, is that the first question that we should ask? When you share Christ with your Hispanic friend, don't start out by asking whether they're legal or illegal. You don't do that. It really doesn't matter when it comes to faith in Jesus Christ because the top priority is getting them to know Jesus Christ and having their sins washed away. The last thing is, is the thing that we struggle with during this particular moment in history. It's been all over the news this week. The Old Testament, we were, uh, we were to assist the stranger, accept the stranger. And then God tells us that we're supposed to assimilate the stranger. And this is where it gets difficult in our country. The, the scripture makes it clear that uh, when outsiders came into Israel, they were to be treated well. Musicians, go ahead and come. I'm about, I'm about finished. Scripture makes it clear they were to be treated very well. The flip side of that coin was this, that sojourners and strangers were not given carte blanche to live any way they wanted to live. We see this in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 26 you shall therefore keep my statutes, my judgments, shall not commit any of these abominations, either any of your own nation or any stranger who dwells among you. Here was, here, this was it. You come to Israel, they assist you, they accept you, and you have to live under the same law that they live under. Listen, folks, I'm going to tell you something. You can't even get saved and have carte blanche to live your life any way you want to. I mean, you're part of a kingdom, kingdom of God. There are things that members of that kingdom can do, cannot do. And so they had to teach, and they had to train, and they had to pour into them. Now, let me just say this. With people who are coming into our country legally, illegally, whatever, whatever, who don't know anything at all about the American way other than they have a dream, same dream that many of you have and that I have. It's an unrealistic expectation to believe that the majority of immigrants can come into this country and do and act and speak and assimilate like you and I do without mentoring and training and coaching. The bottom line is, is that at some point, somebody has to invest in these people, these immigrants, and teach them. Of course they're not going to come in and do everything like you and I do. They don't even know. Many of us, we don't even know what all the laws on this country are. I'm not trying to get a cheap amen there, but that's a fact. And so we have to teach. We have to train. Somebody has to invest 
in them. Let me fast forward. I'm trying to quit. Let me fast forward to what is ultimately going to happen. I want us to look, lastly, at the perfection of immigration. Remember, we started in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve messed up. When sometimes you just like to... (laughs) Adam, what were you thinking? Adam said, God, it's this woman that you gave me. They just messed up. Nimrod comes along, blows up the whole plan. God said, well, maybe they can still have the same language. Nimrod comes along, blows up the whole plan. How many of you know that what blows up in Genesis gets fixed in the book of Revelation? Come on, somebody. (laughs) Revelation fixes all the broken things in Genesis. If you don't read the whole Bible, you miss out on the good news. If all you read is Genesis, you're going to be frustrated because it all gets resolved in Revelation. Revelation. Satan's uh, successful temptation in the Garden of Eden dealt a terrible blow to God's creation. It brought sickness. It brought pain. It brought death. It brought enmity between people. But God will not allow Satan to have victory over what God initially called good. You remember that part of the story? God created this, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. The devil comes along and tempts Eve, and suddenly, man, everything has just went to pot. But I've come to tell you that God is not going to allow what he initially called good to be destroyed by the power of the enemy. And so the book of Revelation envisions the end game of the whole immigration issue. Let me read it to you, can I? From the New International Version, let me read it to you. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 and 10. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude... That no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne of, before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. I don't know about you, but I plan on being there in heaven when that happens. How about you? Amen? Amen. So immigration, it's a hot topic. How should we respond as a Christian? How would Jesus respond? In love. Listen, the world does not need another hateful Facebook post. Uh, it's all over social media. Let me just get real with you. Now, I've got, we've got folks here on both sides of, of the equation and, and, and politically here, both sides of the fence. But here's what we're seeing. Democrats are blaming Republicans, and Republicans are blaming Democrats, and everybody's blaming Trump. It's Trump's fault. Trump's fault. No, it's not Trump's fault. It's Congress's fault. No, it's not Congress's fault. It's Obama's fault. He did it too. He did it too. Nah, 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 boo boo. He did it too. Well, no, it's Bush's fault. It, and, and no, no, no. It goes all the way back to Clinton. And at the end of the day, immigration reform does not stand from the agenda of the donkey or the elephant. Welcoming a stranger is a conviction that flows from the agenda of the Lamb. So today, I encourage you, stop all the finger pointing. He did, he did, he did. No, it was them. Well, look at what they said. Well, look at this clip. Look at this news clip. Look at this. We've worked ourselves up into a frenzy. And let me tell you what the answer is. Just keep seeking God. 
Just keep loving people. And do everything you can in your little corner of the world to shine the brightness and the testimony of Jesus Christ. When people look at you that they don't see you, but they see a reflection of the risen Lord in you. Just keep doing that in your life. And keep being kind. Keep being kind. Kind. I'm not as tripped up about the news media and all that as I am some preachers and, and, uh, and mem- church members and Christians and everything. They're, they're going off like they have lost their ever-loving mind. And they've forgotten. They've forgotten what the greatest commandment is. Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and your neighbor as yourself. Amen? Can we do that here? Can we love everybody? Amen? Stand all across the building. I want you to do something because it'll help me. It won't help anybody else, but it'll help me. Do this. Everybody exhale. (sighs) Wasn't as bad as you thought it would be. When you go looking at the scripture, you'll find out the Bible says a whole lot about immigration. Don't go looking for the word immigrant, though. You won't find it. Strangers. Sojourners. Pilgrims. How many of you all, how many of you in here today know that as a Christian, you're an immigrant here on this earth? Oh, no, 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 no. I am an American. Well, I get it. That's your earthly citizenship. But we're sojourners. We are looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. This old timers used to sing, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me to heaven's golden shore. And I just can't feel at home in this world anymore. We got our problems. We got our problems in, in our country. We got a, this immigration thing is a big problem. It's a big mess. And what we as the church need to do more than ever before. If you, I get it. We all have opinions. We all feel like that, that we need to share them. That's fine. That's fine. But I've come by to ask you today, never forget who you represent. You represent the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's lift our hands and our hearts toward heaven as we're dismissed. In fact, let's just do something a little different. Everybody just head down to, the, head down to this altar. Let's, let's bring the family in for a, for a time of prayer.